Now you can hear us. Sorry about that. I, we switched rooms a couple of times, and I, I forgot to double check the mic. OK. All right. Um, so now, do you want to cut it a bit so we don't have that it grabbing the front yeah, of the? Yeah, let me. And then I'll. OK, so go ahead and adjust the camera tilt. All right. Or we're probably OK, actually. I'll be OK, yeah. Yeah. Um, are we going to be looking at And I don't even, I, you know what? We don't have intros, which is fine. We just do this live. <laughs> so, so folks, uh, you're going to need to put your questions in the uh, Slack channel, because we can't actually see the YouTube. I'm so sorry. We've just moved here, around the lot. Can, we can bring the YouTube up here. That, there. No, no, that's the chat for the wrong stream is the problem. Oh. Uh, yeah. Oh, what? OK, so, yeah, so it, for some reason, you're, OK. okay. We're just, we're just going to go with it. We're yeah. just going to go with it. OK. And then let me just make sure something, let me just bleeped at me, so I just want to make sure it's not. And someone's trying to warn us about something. Okay. Um, okay, okay, I think we're okay. Okay, all right, good. Yeah, no, it, it is, it's one of our, it's Gordon telling us uh, what's going on. All right, let's, uh, so do you want to put the, I guess we, you do want the microphone close. Um, hey, look at that. Just gets fancier by the second. This is why I use Wirecast. Uh-huh, yeah. Uh, all right, well, let's just like officially start, and everyone can just forget whatever happened before this. Hey, everybody. Welcome to this very special uh, episode of Astronomy Casts, very special episodes of Astronomy Casts from the American Astronomical Society 235 in Honolulu, Hawaii, in front of a live audience. There's one very silent human. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, and so we've actually, we're going to be recording two episodes today. We're going to be doing, which are really the two main topics that happened here at the American Astronomical Society meeting that everybody was talking about. Didn't quite come to blows, but uh, close, I think, in some yeah. situations. So, um, well, we thought, why not? Let's just take some controversy head on and uh, we'll go from there. So, um, shall I just begin and then... Um, because what are the numbers? The first one is... So, uh, working to figure that out. Now, you know what? We can, if you want, Nancy, I can record, or Susie, I can record an intro uh, afterwards and then deliver that and, you know, like say, hey, everybody, this is an episode of Astronomy Cast that we recorded, blah, 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 and then, and then you, can, you can edit that together. So why don't we do that? And we'll just go straight into the, into the, into the episode. Now, are we doing... Uh, we're doing 554, okay. which is Physics and Astronomy Culture okay. Hawaii first. Okay, and then... And I found the YouTube video. Okay, great. And then we'll do the Starlink one second. Yes. Okay, great. Let me just get a timer. Uh -huh. And there is no Chad here. Chad is off getting B-roll right now. Yeah, yeah. He's running out of time to to get all the b-roll that he wants for all the videos that we're shooting so he's been he's been shooting madly we've filled up i think we're close to a terabyte of footage that's amazing yeah yeah for for this whole uh we we filled up both video cards twice at this point yeah we've got a ton and ton of interviews we already posted i think i hope people have seen we posted the first interview with ethan siegel uh, that went out uh just today and then there's I have, there's a special guest star from you, and then a ton of other really interesting conversations. So, uh, we've been we've been busting uh, our asses to get uh, to get some footage out for people. So, um, all right, well, let's get into. Let me just start a timer just so I know how long we're taking. Uh, and and Susie, we're gonna since we're single mic'd, I'm just gonna have you strip the audio off of the YouTube to make things easier. On my laptop, not on you. I'm sorry. Yeah. All right. Okay. 
All right, so for this, this is going to be the first part of our two-part episode while we're here in Hawaii, and we're really going to be focusing on the two largest topics that everybody's dealing with. And I don't know if, if whoever had decided to have the American Astronomical Society meeting have its meeting in Honolulu, I'm not sure how long ago it was planned, but of course we've all been watching over the last year the rise of protests over what's going on on Mauna Kea with the 30 meter telescope and all of the other observatories. So for this portion, we're going to talk about, I guess, the controversy and really what's going on in Hawaii, the local voices that we've had a chance to talk to, the concerns of the astronomers, the science they want to do, and maybe even some of the alternative places that, that might have to be chosen if it looks like it's not going to work here in Hawaii. And even what the future holds when the lease runs out right. for the existing observatories that are on Mauna Kea. So, so where do you want to start? So, so to just review some of the history here. Back in the 1960s, there was a lease arranged with the Hawaiian Department of Land Resources that would allow the University of Hawaii to, well, have access to Mauna Kea, a sacred mountain to the Hawaiian people, at a cost of just $1 per year. And there were caveats to this. There could only be a certain small number of telescopes put up there. The indigenous peoples would need to be able to continue to have access to their sites on the mountain. This is a place where people go to hunt, to worship, to, well, be part of this land that is so much a part of the Hawaiian culture and religious system. Now, over the years, different things have come to a head as astronomy has found ways to follow the letter of the law without following the spirit of the law. So for instance, Keck 1 and 2 is counted as, well, one of those observatories, even though it's two giant multimeter telescopes. That act as one together using right. interferometry, yeah. Sometimes. Sometimes, if they need to. Or they could be two separate telescopes looking at separate objects, yeah. And, and at the same time that this, this problem with the astronomers following the letter of the law but not the spirit of the law has been taking place, there's also been a change in the local culture. Back in the 1800s, the Hawaiian monarchy was overrun in the spirit of capitalism to allow essentially the white people who'd been buying land to better, well... Enrich themselves to yeah. maintain control over the island, yeah. What he said. Yeah. And, and, and so, I mean, I think there are more than 100 years of grievances just in general that, that are, have bubbled up in all kinds of places across Hawaii. And, and what's happening with the astronomers is just one example of this general rage and frustration about how uh, First Nations peoples have been treated. I mean, really, I mean, and not just here in, in Hawaii, but we have the same situation in yeah. Canada. There was a, there's, there's unresolved land disputes that are happening in Canada, and I know it's happening in Australia. And, and wherever you've got a, a First Nations people who have been displaced, you've got this pent-up rage and frustration that is looking for any... Uh, hot button issue to try and bring it up back again and and this is a great example again of a of what what is perceived as a very large telescope being put in a very um sacred spot on the mountain but it's just another example of people who aren't islanders making decisions coming here deciding what they want to do and tr and just steamrolling ahead until they get what they want and this, this is a case where at this moment, when we're looking to build the 30 meter telescope, it's that same moment in history when there is a resurgence of bringing back the Hawaiian language, of going back and recognizing that until the 1890s, that sovereign nation that was here, they had a rich culture, a rich international trading system. There are newspapers, recordings that allow that culture to be seen and brought back. And these peoples that want to bring back their culture, they also want to bring back their mountain as being their mountain. 
And so you have a conflict of the astronomers who are like, but, but it's our mountain now. Astronomy, I don't care about your religion. And these are the problems that we faced is over the past decade or so, a large number of scientists have unfortunately put forward arguments along the lines of, but my science is more important than your culture. And there's been a lack of listening and people have been litigating instead of building relationships. And from a scientific standpoint, there's no question. Mauna Kea is without a doubt, the finest place to put a telescope in the Northern Hemisphere. It is the tallest, clearest, uh, most accessible mountain with some of the clearest views from the top of the, of the summit. There's no question that it is, that is really a premier place to put a telescope. That said, um, it has other, other purposes as well. So can, let's talk a bit about sort of what we understand the, and, and with the controversy, of course, with the new 30 meter telescope that's coming in. So let's talk a bit about sort of what the plans are to, to what mitigations they've already put in place for the 30 meter telescope to try to sort of understand. Cause, cause I mean, my perspective has definitely been that, that although they are still moving forward, they are still getting sort of taking the court's judgment on, on this, they did try to work more closely in concert with local locals in the placement, in sort of some of the, con the environmental concerns and things like that. And, and so what we've been hearing at this conference is that in the day right after Christmas, a new accord was found where they were able to, to get one of the tents that had been put up by protesters moved so that there is easier access to the mountain. They have started to actually build, well, these starts of a new relationship. And this has been a recurring theme throughout the week where speaker after speaker, both from the indigenous peoples and from the astronomy community have been saying, we made a mistake. We did not start from a place of building a relationship. Some of the arguments have been kind of weak. One of the things that was brought up is, but hey, we're doing all of this education in the local schools. But then when pressed, they admitted that those are the schools that astronomers' kids are going to, not the schools the local kids are going to majority-wise. There are some efforts with the um, indigenous people school systems and it's this disproportionate hey but look what we're doing from the community that when you dig deeper you realize oh that that doesn't mean what you think it means that has a lot of people saying look you guys you really need to just step back and and figure out how do you build a relationship that's built on respect and not on the yes but argument because the astronomers have really been trying to win this with yes but Mm -hmm. occasionally with yes and, and not instead with let me sit down and listen. And the message I keep hearing is we need to change this to let me just sit down and listen. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a great presentation in one of the conferences from, uh, was it Greg Chun? He was, yes. the, he was from the University of Hawaii in, in Hilo. And he, he said that they, they and he's native born Hawaiian and, mm -hmm. and, and he said that they had taken, um, they'd taken this step back and really had this opportunity to, to listen and to, and to just understand from people, not what's the solution, but just to understand what does the mountain mean to you? How does the mountain play into your personal spiritual practices? What are, what is your definition of a shared use of this, of this mountain? And what does that look like? And the, and the thing that's, that's going to be really difficult is that different people have a different definition of what this is. Some people see the mountain as they have a very specific uh, understanding of the mountain and the way it plays into their into their spiritual beliefs, and this is the location of 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 certain you know um, you know spiritual centers in the mountain, and and for other people it's just about like I want to go up to the top of Mauna Kea and I want to be able to experience the cosmos and not have all of this 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 telescope pollution all around yes. me and then for other people it's it's this is where i hunt and and i want to be able to roam around on the mountain and feed my family 
and not have to come up against walls and fences and gates and be told not where I told where I can and can't go. And so those were some of the concerns. And you can see that that in fact each individual person has a different definition of what it is they want for the mountain. So so you can see that because they're so far apart, there's no way you can go, you know, should we put the 30 meter telescope here or like a little to the right or a little to the left? Is this okay? Does this resolve the deep hundred plus years of, of, uh, you know, uh, treachery yeah. and, you know, it's like, it's oh, it's what a mess. And, and one of the things that just makes all of this so difficult is there's been years of astronomers basically shaking their heads and sometimes their fists saying, well, science just doesn't matter to these people. And, and the people of the Polynesian culture are like, no, that is so wrong. Astronomy is how the Polynesian culture was able to spread from the shores of New Zealand to Tahiti to the Hawaiian Islands and to have this multi-hemisphere culture they had to understand the sky in a way that we look back and people are like, oh, we can't accurately sail until we have watches. They, they figured this out, people. They figured out how to figure mm -hmm. out what the Westerners didn't know how to do. And, and so their understanding and their cultural history is so tied to understanding the stars. This isn't a matter of they don't like astronomy. They're out there using Stellarium just like we are. This is how they teach people navigation now is they use Stellarium and planetariums to practice because let's face it, that's safer than learning in the ocean. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but definitely that the, that the, the, the Polynesians... Uh, sort of culture is really rooted in this connection with the sky, with the stars, with understanding the position and the places and being able to navigate using these using these beacons in the sky. And and so it really it is kind of crazy that it is this it's almost like some of the world's best astronomers should be coming from yes. the Polynesian islands and yet and especially because all of these world-class observatories are located here, and yet there is this disconnect between, between the people from these islands getting to be able to go to university, to be able to uh, gain uh, experience, being able to come back home and do their research on this, on this mountain and contribute to the science. And uh, they, there was a couple of statistics that were interesting. They were saying that maybe 25% of the people who work in the various facilities are, are, are native-born Hawaiians. Which, which doesn't mean that they are fully of indigenous right. blood. Right, yeah. Um, Just people born and raised in, on, in Hawaii. Right. They, they were saying that uh, the indigenous Polynesian heritage people are closer to about 6%, whereas island-wide, the average for the big island is more like 10 to 15%. So they, they are underrepresented among their staff. Um, what I'd be interested in seeing is the separation between specialist and non-specialist staff, because uh, it, it would make sense that, that the PhDs, since there's never been a PhD granted in Hawaii to a native Hawaiian, that the PhDs are clearly underrepresented. Um, but what I'm getting at is this a nuanced problem. And, and there were other things that got thrown around that the astronomers are saying, but yes, but we put so much money into the local economy. We insert a million dollars through what we buy and sell and how we spend well, our salaries. I mean, they were saying 80 million a year. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so they so so when you look at sort of the amount of money they get spent on the islands from the various facilities, it's about eighty million dollars a year, um, and then you know that percolates into the economy. And and for sure, when you look at the at the construction of this telescope, this multi million billion dollar telescope that's going to be I mean, that's a lot of local workers who are going to get jobs to build a telescope but then they went on to point out that when you look at it as a percentage and this is where it always gets trickstery so if you look at what percentage of the budget is space science it's super tiny for the u.s budget well if you look at the island economy to see what percentage of that is infused through scientific dollars through money being spent by the astronomers on the island 
it's, it's a few percent, whereas it turns out things like tourism and the military really dominate, dominate in terms of economic impact. Yeah, I think they said that it, was, it went like, uh, it was tourism, military, um, uh, goods, like Agriculture. agricultural goods, and astronomy was way down the list of, of things that people are, are that, that are contributors to the economy. So, so I think that that argument that the that astronomy is a big contributor to the economy is is not that compelling to the to the people on the islands, and they're more interested in in that. But 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 it, you know, it is very much like you're seeing people protesting, and there are plenty of people that are absolutely for the telescopes. Like, yeah. you know, it is it is definitely you know the the. What we've gotten a sense of here, I think, is just that it's divided, that some people are all for it. They love astronomy. They love the telescopes. They're proud of the fact that, yeah. the, that world-class astronomy is happening here on the island. And other people are, they love the mountain and they don't want any further uh, development on it. And and for other people, they see it as a, just as another example of imperialism here on the island. And, and what we've heard consistently, just to bring this up one more time, is every single one of these groups have said one thing that was in common, and that was, why haven't we built relationships? Mm -hmm. Where is the sitting down and communicating from positions of respect instead of suing that should have occurred between the astronomy community and the indigenous community. Yeah, yeah, it's really unfortunate that it's gone so far through the courts and that now they're having to come back around. And it looks like, for sure, the protesters have made the, the people building the observatories take notice and take this very seriously. Mm -hmm. and so, it's, so the protests have had their effect that, that the law, that their challenge in, in the courts were not able to. And now I think we are going to see a better conversation happen. We're definitely seeing a lot more uh, publicity. I don't know about you, but I, every time I've logged into Twitter, oh, yeah. yeah, every time I've logged into Twitter, there's been some kind of promotional ad telling me how good the telescopes are for the islands. Well, and, and the thing that really got me, though, is all the different places this is cropping up into culture now. This is becoming the, the well, the last point of the battle for a lot of the indigenous peoples, where even Jason Momoa, he, he asked them to delay the filming of Aquaman 2 so that he could be part of the encampment that was limiting access to the mountain. And this goes so far beyond just impacting the construction of the 30-meter telescope. Yes, the, the lawsuits associated with the 30-meter telescope are ridiculously expensive. Yes, this is just burning bridges. But at the same time, the telescopes that have operated there for years and decades, they got shut down for yeah. a while. And so science has already been lost. Relationships have already not been built. We are in a point of recovery, even if the 30-meter telescope doesn't get built. And they openly said that construction isn't going to start anytime soon, that they're going to take a step back and see what can be rescued. So let's talk a bit about what some of the options are right now moving forward. Um, we, the alternative site the, in the Canary Islands, I saw a presentation here talking about the, just the suitability of the Canary Islands as a place for, the, for this telescope. And it's not quite as good as Mauna It's Kea. not as high, it's not as dry. So they won't be able to do right. as much infrared work. But there was a few other um, advantages, and I forget it was like the there was some advantages in the airflow moving mm -hmm. over the over the observatory from the Canary Islands. It's actually a little better, I think, if I understood this correctly. So there are mostly disadvantages. There's a couple of advantages, but the big advantage is there's no political issue in going to in going to the Canary Islands. Spain has already acquired all the permits. Yeah. There's absolute um, agreement from everyone on the Canary Islands. Mountain is not sacred. Yeah, there. Um, and they are perfectly happy to to have the the developments go ahead. So so they are, are fairly confident that if that's the decision that gets made, that they decide that it's just not, in the end, it's not going to work here in Hawaii, they can go to the Canary Islands and still achieve almost all of their science objectives from that location as well. 
And, and one of the things that, that needs to be noted about moving forward re with doing it at Mauna Kea is if that is what ends up happening. According to the court documents so far, they need to shut down five observatories that already exist. So far, they've identified two for shutdown, the Caltech Millimeter Array, which kind of stabbed me in the heart because when that was built, the University of Texas had to shut down their millimeter telescope to pay for Caltech to happen. So uh, that's a still useful, still powerful telescope, although it's been largely overrun by ALMA's capabilities. The other telescope they'd be shutting down is well, a teaching facility. So I think that you'll see, well, the, the bigger concern, of course, is what happens down the road. The leases expire in the- 33. Early, in 2033. And, and so they're still in the process now of attempting to renegotiate the continuation of the facilities from beyond 2033, but that's still an unknown. So I think we're gonna find that, um, you know, if uh, if things don't go well that way, then it's going to be a whole other uh, man, like a completely new renegotiation. And one of the, the concerns in looking at this is currently the University of Hawaii is taking on the chin pretty much all of the costs associated with security, with with just maintaining the basic infrastructure that's needed to allow all the rest of the observatories to exist. The University of Hawaii is, of course, paying that $1 a year lease. Now, if the lease goes up in costs, that's not something the University of Hawaii can take on on their own. So how do we as a community, well, make this a fairer place for all the observatories? Uh, the phrase charging rent came up, and no one was in favor of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine what the rent would be on, on the top of a mountain? Um, <laughs> yeah. So I, so at this point, I think everything is stalled. Yes. Um, but at least the, they've stopped construction efforts. The, the, the protests have stopped. People are able to go up the mountain to do science and and they're now, it looks like the conversations that should have started happening a long time ago are now happening more in, in earnest. And hopefully they'll come to some kind of settlement outside of the courts to be able to continue construction. And, and while a lot of people aren't in their heart saying we need to build a relationship, at least the party line is we need to build a relationship. And sometimes... Faking it till you make it can change your heart. So I'm one of the people that's hoping that a real relationship can be built that does benefit the indigenous people, that does keep the mountain open while also allowing the science to continue. And this is going to be an issue for, for all the future observatories. The, when you think about things like the square kilometer array, that... that we're entering this realm of these mega telescopes that mm -hmm. you're going to need a big chunk of land to get your science done, that these things are going to be orders of magnitude larger and more infrastructure required. And, and that means you're going to have a bigger impact both environmentally as well as just on, on everybody in your, you know, people's land. Like you got to realize that if you're going to try to do some of this big science, which we all want them to do, mm -hmm. you've got to make sure that you take everybody's uh, opinions into account. And, and astronomy has a history of periodically being able to figure out how to do this really well. With a very large array in New Mexico, the United States, they figured out, well, we can put the railroad tracks out, move the telescopes around, and still allow cows to graze there. So occasionally a telescope gets taken down by a cow using it as a back scratcher. But that's rare, really funny. And the farmers and the astronomers found a way to both use the land. We need to find a way here to yet again both yeah. use the land. All right. Well, thanks, Pamela. Uh, we will. I, I will talk to you in a moment about the other controversial uh, topic that we had here at the AAS meeting. Um, so we'll 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 see you next week in five minutes. That yes, that is exactly what will happen. And I'm so sorry. I don't have our Patreon names with us. I will be providing that audio to Susie later. 
Um, but Patreon people, no, we love you, we survive by you, and if you out there watching right now are not supporting us on Patreon and want to see this show continue, please consider checking us out at patreon.com slash astronomycast. Nancy's asking if we're gonna switch links. We probably shouldn't, so let's, let's yeah. because I don't think that we can bolt into the live event through the Wirecast the way it's set up right now. I think when you're going daily space, you're just going, or whatever, you're going directly into the, anyway, let's not change. Yes. Okay, let's just, let's just move on to the next topic and make this a whole separate episode. Yeah. And, um, and. Can someone pull the 255 link and just keep this one up? Um, so the problem that we ran into to explain for all of you who know the behind the scenes sausage making is the way the Weekly Space Hangout works is there's always the same YouTube link. With Astronomy Cast, we have individual links for every episode, but Wirecast doesn't let me plug into those individual links the way it works, and we realized that as we went live. Sorry. <laughs> all right, um, we'll let that uh, cart go past. Yeah, they're literally cleaning yeah. the convention center and taking things down around us. Can you hold this for a second? Sure. I do need to give someone a message. All right, uh, there were some questions there that I wanted to Grab. Wow, this microphone's really heavy. Yeah. It feels like it's like really lightweight. I don't know if you can see this. This thing feels like it's made of cast iron. Wow. You could kill someone. Yeah, you it. easily could. I'm actually so, going to reach out to the person on my phone if you want to scroll through. Uh, sure. Um, uh, so Paranor Third Rock Astronomy is asking, what about putting it in the UAE, or do we actually need these observatories on mountaintops? Yeah, you want your observatories on mountaintops. You want to get above as much of the Earth's atmosphere as you can, and the way to do that is to be on a mountaintop. So the Canary Islands are good. They're pretty high. Uh, the Hawaiian Islands, Mauna Kea is really good. You could imagine there might be some places, say, um, Mount McKinley would probably be a really nice place mm. to put an observatory. No, clouds, weather. Well, yeah, but except it's a, be terrible, and it's not a, <laughs> you know, it's not a very nice mountain to try to drive up to the top of. So, uh, you know, Mount Everest would be a great place to put a telescope, but the weather is brutal. So, uh, yeah, you want to have nice weather and uh, as little atmosphere above you as, as possible. So ideally, they look for the dry side of mountain ranges. You always have the rainy side and the dry side with mountains ranges that are in the correct uh, north-south orientation. So you build on the dry side of the mountain range. And uh, look for some place that has as many clear nights a year, a year as possible and doesn't have the jet stream going straight overhead. All right, so let's move on to the next episode. All right. All right. Ready? Uh-huh. 325. Uh, put the, do, can we put the microphone on the table? We don't have a table. No, we don't have a table. We get, I can hold it. Yeah, more. we don't want to put the microphone. I mean, you don't want to transfer hand noise to the microphone. Okay. All right, so, so here we are back at the American Astronomical Society meeting in Honolulu, Hawaii. And we last episode, we talked about the big controversy of the uh, construction of the 30-meter telescope here on the, on the Hawaiian Islands. The other big controversy that's going on is, of course, the Starlink constellation. And literally just a couple of days uh, ago, SpaceX launched the third batch of Starlink satellites, another 60 satellites into space. And it is safe to say that astronomers are outraged. I think that's an understatement. Understatement, yeah. And there, there were three different arguments put forward. And I have to admit, at the top of this episode, I am somewhat biased. I desperately want to see the digital divide to be overcome and low-cost internet to be available globally. And Starlink promises that. And so a lot of what we're going to talk about today, the issue comes down to whether or not you trust Elon Musk to actually implement the low-cost low internet. So the three arguments that we heard today against Starlink, um, one was a cultural problem of, Oh, but the children. 
if you see satellites zipping around in the sky, will people still fall in love with the stars? Will your experience visiting a dark sky site turn you off to astronomy if you see satellites? And the cry of outrage we heard was that people won't be inspired by the sky if they see man-made objects. Now, I have to admit, I distinctly remember exactly where I was the first time I saw a satellite. I, I was up in the mountains of the Caucasus camping beside a glacier and I was sitting on a rock all by myself because being a teenager is hard and I was 15 and sometimes you need to sit on a rock by yourself when you're 15. And this satellite, I just saw something moving in the sky and I realized what it was and that realization of I'm alone on a rock beside a glacier, but there's a satellite moving through my stars. That, that at the age of 15, was an amazing moment. And, and this idea that satellites make it impossible for people to fall in love with the stars, I, I don't think that's the case, but mm -hmm. it was one of the arguments put forward. Yeah, and, and I, I know we'll get into the other arguments in a second, but, but sort of like from a practical, technical standpoint, when the Starlinks are first launched, they are actually very bright. They're about magnitude two or three, which makes them easily visible to the unaided eye from many spots on the Earth. And they look like this train of, that's moving across the sky. They call this, this uh, uh, string of pearls. Um, and, and then as the Starlinks raise their altitude up to their final position of about 550 kilometers altitude, they have dimmed back to about a five magnitude, which is at the very limits of what the human eye can see in nice dark skies. And, and, but of course, in the eyes of, a, of an astronomer, that is incredibly bright. A, a fifth magnitude star is a very bright star in, in the eyes of a telescope. And then the other problem is that when, when they pass across the sky, they will really only be visible to astronomy when they are low on the, on the horizon during the summer months. So when, it's, when the night is the longest, the, sorry, when the night is the shortest, um, you're going to get, uh, really you're only going to be able to see these satellites right, at the, right after twilight and right before sunrise, and, and that's it. You have to be, and then for the for the rest of the night, there won't be seen any of these satellites. But as the nights get longer, the satellites get brighter over over the entire night sky, and so they're anticipating that over some of the the big observatories in Chile and in the northern hemisphere, when you're in the middle of the longest nights, you're going to see these these satellites run across the entire sky. So, so there's no question that these are going to be very bright objects that are going to move through your field of view and leave streaks. And, and one of the things that people keep bringing up is there's already thousands of pieces of stuff. There's 18,000 tracked pieces that you can pull from the database right now. 18,007, I think. You can pull from the database and you can track the position using like Celestis and other yeah. other things like that. Um, yeah, so they're, you know, we know. And so adding another 1,200, which is the goal for well, Starlink. So, so let's narrow this down even further. So there's 18,000 things up there. Prior to the launch of Starlink, only 200 objects were naked eye visible. So you could only look up 200 different things in heavens above and go outside and see them with your unaided eye. With Starlink, they're adding well over a thousand by the end of this year to the list of things that will be visible to the unaided eye. And it's this brightness that is really the problem. I, I was an observational astronomer for a number of years before realizing I am the rain god. Uh, in those years that I was an observational astronomer, I had myriad satellites go through my images, but because they were low brightness objects, there'd be this straight line of pixels that, well, I couldn't see stars in. But that line was the size on the sky that the satellite was on the sky. With Starlink, what's happening is these, well, captured 
photons that are reflected off of the satellite, there are so many of them that they saturate the pixels, spill over to adjacent pixels, wiping out a larger swath of your detector than the satellite alone would wipe out. And when you saturate a pixel, that saturation can cause the next several images to have ghosts of that satellite's passage still visible. So not only are you wiping out a larger percentage of pixels with that satellite, but you're wiping them out across multiple images. Yeah, and and so, you know, a lot of these 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 satellites as they pass the field of view can overwhelm the sensor mm -hmm. and essentially make an entire observing frame worthless and the speed that they're moving is of great concern to the astronomers as they as they move through it's about how quickly is this thing moving through your field of view and how long do you have to not be able to take data while this while the satellite is is moving through, so so they're they're quite concerned just about overall in the time domain as mm -hmm. well, and of course the the big observatory that's going to be the most affected is the newly uh, uh, renamed. Oh, that's a different controversy. No, I know that's like the third <laughs> the third controversy, but we won't get into that. But the newly, but we we I think we can all agree that the the Vera Rubin observatory, observatory. is a wonderful name yes. for an observatory, and that is going to be the. That is going to be, that's going to be the facility that's going to be deeply affected because it just is staring wide-eyed at the sky for all night, capturing as much as it can, as deeply as it can. And so every frame is going to have Starlinks and OneWebs and all this passing and, through them. And this is, an, this is a problem of, because it has a giant field of view, the probability that there's going to be a star link in any one image goes up. If you have a small field of view, there's the potential that you can time your images to avoid having a star link in them. But because this is a huge field of view, your ability to do that is greatly reduced, and they're going to end up picking up star, la star links left and right. And here the question starts to become one of mitigation. So folks are working with SpaceX to see, OK, what do we need to do to reduce the brightness of these objects so that they aren't blowing out the detectors? Yeah, and there's more to it than that. So, so uh, someone from SpaceX actually gave a presentation this morning, and that was actually a bit of a surprise. And they didn't do a very good job of, of letting us know that this yeah. was going to happen. There weren't a lot of people. We had the whole ballroom, and there wasn't a lot of people there listening to her, her talk. But they mentioned essentially a couple of mitigation strategies. So the first thing is with this first launch, they have they have applied some darkening materials to one of the 60 satellites to see if they have some of their ideas to make them to have a lower albedo, lower reflectivity. And, and before you laugh at the fact that it's only one, yeah. the thing you have to take into mind is these suckers were already largely built in preparation and turning around and refabricating, that takes time. And so my suspicion, my hope, ugh, is that, that they were only able to fabricate one with the new materials fast enough to be able to test. And I think it's, you know, this is how you perform an experiment, yeah. right? Is you, you isolate the variable, does putting all this material on one of the satellites make it darker than the rest, and, and we'll find out what happens. So, so that's the first thing they did is they're experimenting. And, and this is a good sign. I mean, this is like literally, this is the first time I think that any satellite constellation has ever had a conversation with astronomers and said, what can we do to minimize our impact on your science? I don't, there's iridiums, you know, the 200 others that we mentioned, plus all the, the 18,000, no one's ever tried to make them not bright in the eyes of astronomers. So, so the first strategy is to try to paint them so that they're a little darker. The second thing is to provide an open sourced, real time location of all of the satellites in their constellation and to communicate with the other networks and anyone out there who is, who is gonna be relying on knowing the position of these Starlinks. So in theory, as the as the constellation gets built, you're, if you're a telescope operator, you are going to know when a Starlink is going to be passing through your detector, and you'll be able to shut the detector down, wait for the Starlink to pass, open the detector again, and continue to get your to get your data. So you won't necessarily get that that if you've got a very precise amount of time, you'll be able to use it carefully 
navigating around satellites as they're coming by. The other thing is they're going to provide a very specific, um, and I forget what this what the technical term was, but essentially the, the launch trajectory of each new constellation as they go up. So when that first trail is starting to head off into space and it is going to cause horrible streaks in any telescope, any amateur astrophotographer is going to get this as well, they're going to sit there. You're going to know when that, when that constellation is going to be passing through, where it's going to be, and just to, to plan your observing time around those Starlink launches. And it only, you know, it's only a, a few months or really it's only a few days, a, a week that they're in this trail. And then they sort of spread out and shift themselves to that higher orbit. But, but the second problem that we're talking about one of the, the additional parts to this is while so far SpaceX has been extraordinarily in, in terms of trying to build a relationship saying, look, yes, we're going to work with you. Here's all the ways we're going to work with you. SpaceX is just one of a myriad of companies looking to do this. And so is, is China, when they start launching their constellations, are they going to do the same thing with open source abilities to yeah. track? Did you know that China launched more rockets last year than, than the United States? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, so like this is like whatever happens with Starlink, there will be a Chinese version of Starlink. And, and what is going to happen with all the other companies looking to do this? Because you know if SpaceX yeah. is doing this, it's just a matter of time before we see the same coming from Amazon and, yeah. well, from everyone else. So while things so far, if you are willing to trust that they will do what they say, and this is a sticking point for a lot of people, I understand. While... It's promising for SpaceX. We don't know what the future will hold, and this is honestly terrifying to a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of really mad people because they're anticipating, uh, and it's and it and I mean, it is so interesting. And I hope you're. This is already starting to kind of echo the previous conversation that yes. we had. It is completely flipped around. You have got astronomers who have this resource. Um, the the night sky that they're using to gather data and it is it is sacred to them and you have someone coming in and saying wanting, oh but the internet yeah oh but the internet wanting to take wanting to utilize this resource and the astronomers being being concerned and wanting more dialogue and wanting to have their concerns taken very seriously. So obviously the the whole irony of the situation is not lost on They're using on the me. same words. Yeah, there was an they really individual are, yeah. today making a purely emotional argument saying, but this is our cultural heritage. This yeah. is sacred to us. Yeah, yeah. It's the exact same argument. Yeah, it absolutely is. And so you can see the same the same method for uh, being able to uh, resolve what's happening with Hawaii is going to be the same method that's going to be resolved. Uh, there was a couple of other really interesting things. One is the, the the sort of the opportunity to be able to resolve this like with regulation. That ship has sailed. Yes. That horse is out of the barn. And, and in fact, the the people who are who are the astronomers who are working with SpaceX on this have said right now there there is no regulation option to be able to stop spacex from doing what they're doing to stop these uh the only there is there was one issue which was that um in the radio spectrum and this is the third problem right okay so in the radio spectrum uh there was a very specific set of the radio spectrum that the that the astronomers, or sorry, that the satellite constellations aren't allowed to use. It's this 300, 250 megahertz, and it, it accounts for about one eighth of the spectrum that these these constellations are able to use. And they were able to get them to seed that part of the spectrum for radio astronomy, which has already sort of partly been um, sort of defined by by regulation. And so they were able to ratchet that back. And so you've got this part of the spectrum, which originally the satellite constellations were wanting to use and they have agreed to not use in order to continue protecting that spectrum for astronomy. And this gets back to the relationship issue, because one of the things that we heard over and over was, but they haven't turned on the satellites and we don't trust them to have actually done what they said. So there's a lot of, a lot of fear right now, because there isn't the relationship, that 
these constellations aren't going to do what they promised and are instead going to do as the Iridium satellites did and just stomp all over the astronomical protected parts of the radio spectrum. And, and so again, these two problems completely par parallel each other where because there is a lack of trust, because there is a lack of relationship, the, the communications companies are saying, we're just trying to get internet to remote parts of the world, people. Yeah. And the astronomers are saying, we don't trust you. Yeah, and you could have at least told us what your plans were, and we could have worked with you over years to come up with strategies and use all that engineering capability that you have to minimize the impact on both the night sky for everybody. And because, I mean, I think that, yeah, we've lucked out with this batch, right? Yes, if you go outside in almost any circumstance, you will not be able to see starlings. Mm -hmm. Like, they are not going to be this grid of dots in yeah. the sky that you are going to see and it is going to besmirch your vision of the heavens. But as we enter the space age and we get our, um, you know, and, and we get our gigantic rotating s space stations, as we get our, um, we're going you know, to lose the sky eventually. We're going to lose the sky. Yeah, it is. And so that is the downside. The downside of that Star Trek future is watching the Starship Enterprise shine brightly in the night sky while you're just trying to watch the meteor shower as the Enterprise flies overhead. And I'm kind of okay with that. No, I'm not. No. And no. but but what we're saying is, a lot of this comes down to people are currently afraid. And fear isn't facts. So when you hear people with both Mauna Kea, as we talked about in the last episode, and with Starlink, as we're talking about today, saying, but we don't trust. Yeah. But we are concerned that this is sacred to us. What you're hearing is one group of people who just want to try something new and amazing and advanced society. And another group of saying, but we don't care about your advancements. We're happy the way we are. Please go away. Yeah. And we need to build relationships if we do want to move forward so that we can move forward together and sometimes be able to say, I don't agree with you. Yeah. But we've talked this out and you've heard what I have to say, so I'm going to now sit down and support you. And this is something that comes out of the software community a lot. You hash everything out, figure out how you're going to move forward. You have all the disagreements, but once you come to that conclusion, you support the path forward. But you have to have the relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's 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 work on building the relationships. Yeah, and I think you know, I mean, obviously the the position that I've had um, for quite a while is is that is that it is now inevitable that everyone on Earth is going to want access to the internet. It is the way that we as human beings will connect. And so then the question is, what is the way? Yeah. Are we going to build millions? Right now, there's five million cell towers around the world, and it'll take more than five million more cell towers to to complete the, the last mile to get everybody online. Are, how many cell towers do we want to go with 5G? What's the impact on, on oh, sorry, is it, the, yeah, is it? 5G. Is it, yeah, 5G. What's well, the impact of 5G on, I mean, it looks like those are actually pretty serious transmission power and we don't know what that's going to do. There's those birds, eradicate weather. Yeah, there's satellite. bird strikes on, on, there are millions of birds that hit cell towers, right? And, like, and beyond that, just the fact that it is cost uh, prohibitive to run fiber optics to all the little islands of the world to run the wires to every rural village in, well, Canada. Yeah, you got to lay cable through sensitive marine environments. You've got to dig big, long fiber optic tunnels through uh, permafrost, through, uh, it's, it's madness to, tr to consider the engineering to planet Earth that'll be required to provide the same level of internet access that that these satellite constellations are going to provide. And one thing that we did talk about a bit is, is that there's gonna be multiple constellations. There's not just Starlink. There's mm -hmm. the one from Amazon. OneWeb has already launched six satellites. The OneWeb ones are at an altitude of 1,200 kilometers and they are visible for the entire pass through the field of view. There's no time that they're not visible. They're always visible. But they're dimmer because they're farther. Yeah. So they're 
only eighth magnitude, but which is still highly bright in in any telescope. And there's going to be more of those. And as you said, there's the Chinese ones. There's the there's the Amazon. The Amazon is planning 3,000 plus satellites. One one of the phrases that was used today is this is an existential crisis. Yeah. Do we protect the skies at the cost of our environment as we lay new communications lines and towers across the world? Do we sacrifice the astronomy to erase the digital divide? Do we find a way to maybe compromise both and protect a few places? There are, after all, places, and I believe it's Virginia, where you can't use a cell phone because of the radio quiet zone. Yeah. There are compromises, but they require relationships. Yeah, and, I, and I, with... You know, there are 150 dark sky preserves around the world. Mm -hmm. They account for 100,000 square kilometers of space in 20 different countries that you can go to and you can see the Milky Way. You can see the night sky in a way that, that the vast majority of humanity will never see it. And if we lose those spaces, we will lose that connection to the night sky with light pollution peaks into every single corner of, of of planet Earth, and there's no place you can go to be able to see the sky as it's meant to be seen, that will be an absolute shame. And I really hope that we can figure out some kind of compromise that allows us to continue enjoying the sky, continue to do science, but also be able to connect to people around the world. And 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 I don't think anyone knows the solution yet. Um, one one quick additional comment I know people are asking about this idea of painting the the satellites black or use Vanta black or stealth technologies and so someone actually brought this up in a in a conversation it was in one of the press conferences and they were saying that that in fact um, the problem is, is that if you paint the telescope black it now radiates in the infrared so the visible astronomers have an easier time with the night sky but now the infrared astronomers have a worse time and of course at this whole time the radio astronomers are just screaming in pain from the uh, from the shouting telescope so it's 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 it is going to be a thorny issue, and uh, I sort of wish we had started this conversation 10 years ago as opposed to now as these constellations are going up one after the other. And, and this is really a case that is brought about because the astronomers were off sitting doing their astronomy quite happily, not worried about how do you get the Internet to the rest of the world, whereas the communications companies that well, make their money off of how do we get more people on the internet. They were thinking through this. And Dr. Phil Metzger is, is someone who's actually done some interesting writing on this and, and just points out that this is a necessary step in the communications infrastructure of building a society. In the future, we will probably figure out how to do things that are lower latency, which means there's less lag time between the, the two, uh, between sending and receiving the signals, um, that, that can be handled in a different way than just sticking satellites in low enough orbits to drop the latency while also not having huge power requirements. We're not there yet. And, and so this is a temporary step. And we don't know what the future's going to be. be. It's going to be bright. <laughs> well, it's going gonna, gonna to be light polluted. Yeah. So, so here's the thing, though. You'll still be able to see the Milky Way. These aren't providing the kind of light pollution that a city provides. This is the kind of light pollution of you're looking at the Milky Way, and it's like there's an airplane dashing across it, except it's moving much faster and isn't as bright as an airplane. So if you can imagine uh, if you've ever gone camping someplace that isn't a dark sky preserve that doesn't have air traffic above it, uh, if you've ever gone out to a farm, if you've ever gone out to Yellowstone, you can see that Milky Way, and then you also see all the air traffic. That's what we're looking to, is it's going to be like a lot more air traffic, but you can, by eye, still see all the faint things. If you're trying to take images, you're doomed. Yeah. It's the people who are imagers that are doomed. Yep. Yeah, I, I mean, I already have to throw away so many frames from my astrophotos. I just can't imagine how, how where this is going to go next. All right, well, so I hope that gives everyone the update, which is uh, Starlink marches on, astronom astronomers uh, are continue to be outraged, and uh, 
we will continue this conversation over time as more and more of these uh, satellites go up and, and more, hopefully, mitigation strategies are, are figured out. Well, thanks, Pamela. It was uh, super fun to, as always, hang out with you in person here yes. in, in one of these American Astronomical Society meetings. It's been, I think, 10 years since I've been to one. I don't know how recent It's been you've... a few years for me as well. Yeah, yeah. This was an important one, but I hope people enjoy all of the content that we've been streaming bringing back and uh, who knows maybe we'll go and do the next one and he didn't do it so i will his guide to space and question and answer shows are about to have a flood yeah. of amazing content so check those out if you haven't already and if you want to hear more about the news that has come out this week check out the daily space that we're putting out with cosmoquest all right and we'll see you uh next week we will see you all next week bye-bye um all right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, yeah, to the beach or to the airport? To the airport. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Chad um, was able to dip his toes in the water once. Oh. Uh, yeah. And then, so I haven't seen the beach yet. I haven't seen I the will beach. admit to that. Yeah. But I, because I have no one else paying for me to be here, and unlike him who can use footage to pay for himself through Guide to Space, I'm just here to give presentations. So... Uh, I tacked on a vacation since I already had to personally pay for the airfare. Yeah. So I'm going to see the beach tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, good. Oh, yeah. We're, no, we're flying out tonight. Our flight out is at like 11.50 tonight, and then we're flying through the night and then get back first thing tomorrow morning to to Courtney and then, I don't know, sleep, work? Yeah. I'm not sure. But I'm, I'm flying out Saturday morning, and next week I'll be back and uh, bringing you everything from Edwardsville again. Right on. Okay. Well, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Um, and we will uh, we'll see you back when we have uh, regular fast internet and we're not worried about getting uh, kicked out of a room. So <laughs> bye bye we'll everyone. We'll see you guys later.